Vanessa, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, it's it's great. So I want to start here. <laughs> I think your bio or one of them that I read <laughs> says you're a behavioral investigator. How do you become a behavioral investigator? Basically, I love people watching, and that's just a more mm. formal title for me. So I, right. So, you know, I'm a recovering awkward person, which is probably uh-huh. a little bit more accurate in my bio. And because of that, I am an, a social overthinker. So mm. growing up, I would tend to misinterpret cues being sent to me. And that was actually the cause of my awkwardness, where I would walk into a room and I wasn't sure, did I say something wrong? Oh, did I do something weird? Are they angry at me? I always leave dinner parties and I'd ask my husband, is she mad at me? He'd be like, what are, what are you talking about? Of course not. Oh. And that is because, and this is a fundamental problem that I had, I was misinterpreting neutral cues as negative. Mm. And that is, that is actually a, 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 something that happens in our brain where it's almost like a lens or a filter. And so I began observing people and really critically taking notes simply because I was misreading all the cues. Little did I know that there are other people who have the same problem. I thought this was, I thought I was like the only one. I was like, am I dyslexic for people? Like I literally thought that that was, that was a weird filter that I had. Turns out actually this is a very common problem because people who get social anxiety, social overwhelm, or even folks who are very smart and very charismatic who get too much in their head or too much about their idea, they can also misinterpret cues. So that is how I became a behavioral investigator was, could we code behavior? Can we look at, this This whole journey started um, about 17 years ago, where I noticed that highly charismatic people, and it didn't matter where they were in the world. It didn't matter if they were an athlete or a celebrity or a politician or a business leader or a pastor. If they were highly charismatic, they showed a strikingly set of similar cues nonverbal, verbal, and vocal. And I wondered, I'm not naturally charismatic, but maybe I could code the cues they were using and maybe we could learn them. Okay, this is really interesting. So a little bit of free therapy here. Yeah. That's why we do podcasts, right? So, um, okay, and this is gonna, I don't know how to say this in a way that- I'm excited. Doesn't sound like I'm about to say it, but- Tell me. Okay, I, I was always told I had a lot of charisma from a very young okay. age. However, mm-hmm. I always thought of myself as awkward because I do not know how to read people. I was oblivious. So I would go in, I would get it wrong. I would think they were really excited when they were upset. I would think they were upset when they were actually really happy. I'm like, I don't even know how to read it. And I have learned because I have great people around me. I will have people who read the situation for me and then tell me like, so I'm not alone. You in that. are not alone. And here's, what's really funny is charisma is a very peculiar trait mm-hmm. and as a, not a cool kid, right? I was not a cool kid, right? Like I was, at- I was always on the fringe. I wasn't a cool kid. I was just like, they were standing sure. in the, in the yeah, corner I was- and I was allowed to stand right behind. Oh, we them. were in the same group. So- you and I would have been great friends oh, okay. in school. You and I were great friends in school. Although I went to an all girls school. So that would have been interesting for you. Oh, there you go. So- yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So what's really interesting is I used to think that charisma was an innate trait, right? Mm. The cool kids, they were born with those great hand gestures. They were born with a great fashion sense. I thought there's no way you could learn it. But actually what research finds is that we absolutely can cultivate charisma. And it's a very interesting trait because being charismatic does not preclude you from being awkward. Mm. In fact, there are many very charismatic people and they take the stage and they know all the cues. They know the energy to put out there. But inside or afterwards, they have to like lay down on the bed. They're like, I am so exhausted. Oh, yeah, I am so that's me. And so here's the good thing is if this is you, if you feel both charismatic and awkward, or if you're awkward and wish to be charismatic, you can have both at the same time. And the other good news, and this is really important for me, is I am not an extrovert. I'm actually an mm-hmm. ambivert. I'm somewhere mm-hmm. in between introvert and extrovert. Most of the soft skills books out there, even like, you know, Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People, they're written by extroverts. And so their advice is be more extroverted. (laughs) Yeah. For an ambivert or an introvert is exhausting, right? It is so hard to be authentic. And I think that to be charismatic, truly long lasting charismatic, you have to be authentic, which we can talk about where that, how that shows up. If you're an introvert trying to fake being outgoing it will not last long enough. Mm. 
And so my goal is how can we learn to be charismatic and still honor our introversion or our ambiverted moments and also know that we're going to have awkward moments and that's okay. Yeah, that, I mean, there's so much in just that. I, I can think of people I know, and I think listeners would be able to identify a few who are very charismatic, authentic, genuine on stage. But when you meet them in real life, they're kind of yes. awkward. It's like they've got this thing that happens when they walk out and they put on, and it's real. Yeah. Like this is not, oh, I studied, mm-hmm. but they're so good. And then you meet them in the hallway and you're like, ooh, that was a little underwhelming. Okay, so you just put your finger on something very important, which I think we oft, we used to hide it. I want to kind of bust that myth. Hmm. No, highly charismatic people, they use their charisma like a dial. When they need to be on stage, when they're presenting an idea, when they're trying to raise funds, when they're you know speaking about something they're passionate about, they can dial up that charisma and they can tap into a very authentic place that's high energy. Hmm. But they also ha- have a, a one-to-one quiet contemplative power that might be much more introverted when they're one-to-one or when they're in a small group meeting or when they're with their colleagues. And then they can dial into that charismatic introversion, that powerful contemplative quiet space. Both of those are charismatic. There is not one flavor of charisma. Yes, there's the bubbly extrovert that can be Mm. important on stage, but there's also the empathetic, nurturing healer. There's also the quiet, contemplative introvert. There's also the wise sage. All of those are charismatic. The key is knowing what feels authentic to you. So if you're more introverted, trying to dial up into being the life of the party is not going to work for you. (laughs) <laughs> right. And so that, I think that that's the problem that we have is my, can we identify that specific flavor, our flavor of charisma, and how can we hone it? Hmm. Yeah. You know, and the ambivert part is really interesting. I've talked to a number of leaders about this. My wife says I am an um, ambivert with extrovert memory. Oh. And what happened was after two decades in leadership, leading people, people rapidly growing, you know, we start with a handful, then you have thousands oh. of people. I kind of got peopled out. Yeah. And what I find now is I can go into a party and my extroverted nature comes out. But then afterwards, I'm like, where's the nearest sofa? I'm going to lie down, <laughs> um, you know, which is which is weird. So just a note to leaders, that's not strange. I, Vanessa, I there's so much I want to cover with you. OK, go ahead. Say, say what you're going to say. And then, it's and so then we'll drill down. It's so important for leaders. because I think that leaders are exactly what you're saying is they know how to turn it on. They know how to work it. This is I want you to think of your social energy like a muscle. It's, it's just like going to the gym, right? When we, are, when we are practicing for years, growing our leadership, learning how to communicate with people, it's like we're doing bicep curls, we're doing our squats, and we get better and better at it. That's why leaders who maybe start with small groups and then all of a sudden they're leading big groups or they're speaking to big organizations, they're literally strengthening their social muscle. The problem is, is just like a muscle, it can get fatigued, it can get overworked. And so your key is figuring out, okay, What's my ideal social social energy, right? Okay, maybe I can deliver a sermon or I can diver, deliver a presentation. I have about an hour or two left in me, but after that, I need some quiet time. Honoring that and not being ashamed of it or feeling like you're bad or wrong, that is actually what charismatic people are doing. They are cultivating and using their social energy so purposefully that they can fine tune it. No, that is super helpful because you're right. It's not, I'm sure it is sometimes, but I know for me and a lot of my friends, it's not a question of being inauthentic. It's not like, oh, I turned on something fake in the room. It's just like, you know, the the power went out and uh, I got to go relax. And that is a, a part of your gift as well. Okay. So you hint at it in your new book, uh, which, by the way, I left on a trip somewhere. So I had to buy the Kindle. So two copies. Very happy to buy two. Um, <laughs> but it's called Q, right? Uh, and uh, yes. so, yeah, Q's. Thank you. Q's. Anyway, long story short, you hint at it in Q's, but you have a whole he- TED talk on this. Uh, and because we have so many public speakers listening to this, let's talk about the study you did on TED Talk. So you gave a TED Talk on TED Talks. And I I thought every point is worth mentioning because it is so true. I evaluate communicators for friends when they're hiring and I'll be like, he doesn't have it or she has it. And I don't know what it is, but I think you stumbled on the secret sauce. Some of it. I know what it is. I think I know what it is. Uh So it, and this is a perfect tie-in for both cues and my TED Talk. It is the perfect sweet spot of warmth and competence. 
We are extremely drawn to people who specifically rank high in these two traits. And this is research from Princeton University, which found that people, leaders who are high in warmth, collaboration, trust, likability, but at the very same time and in equal measure, high in competence, power, capability, intelligence, we are drawn to them because they answer two of our most basic human questions. Can I trust you? And can I rely on you? So when a TED speaker mm. walks on the stage, when a business leader hops on a video call, when someone walks into a room and they are cueing or signaling to everyone, high warmth, high competence, high warmth, high competence, we are drawn to them because their cues are contagious. And this is where the research gets really interesting. I think that the reason we love highly charismatic leaders is we want to catch their charisma. Research mm. has found that when someone shows up signaling or broadcasting warmth and competence, we are more likely to be more warm and competent ourselves. And so what I share with my leaders, most of my leaders are, are servant leaders. They are incredibly compassionate. They are doing what they do to help others. And what I say is charisma is not just an investment in yourself. Yes, I want you to be your most charismatic self. But actually, if you want to inspire others, the best thing you can do is be charismatic yourself because that is going to trigger other people's inner charisma as well. We measured this. We started this with this major TED Talk experiment. I love TED Talks. And mm -hmm. I wondered, this is a very interesting group of data. Here you have really smart people. If you get asked to do a TED Talk, you are smart right? You know that you have a good idea, you're successful. But some TED Talks go viral. Millions and millions mm -hmm. of views. Other talks don't. They have thousands of views. And even with people who are relatively unknown, right? A bunch of professors, all from the same university, some TED Talks have millions of views, some have a couple thousand. And I wondered why. Why is it that mm -hmm. some people can enter the stage, stand on that red dot, and within the first 10 So we coded all of these different variables looking for patterns, and there was one striking pattern, and it was that the most popular TED Talks, and this is just based on view count, the most popular mm -hmm. TED Talks use more gestures, specifically competent gestures. And when we counted these, the least popular TED Talkers use an average of 272 gestures in 18 minutes. The most popular wow. TED Talkers use an average of 465. Almost in 18, in 18 minutes, 18 gestures. Minutes. So you're talking about hand yes, movements. And, wow. Yes, and so what's so funny is there's even a sound, a vocal sound that really good TED Talkers hit. It's this perfect balance of warmth and competence when you analyze their vocal power. It sounds like this. <clears throat> and usually there's gestures to go along with it, okay? So this is what almost all the best TED Talks sound like, different from the, the least popular. <clears throat> okay. Here it goes. Today, I want to talk to you about a big idea I'm going to break it down into three different areas that are going to change your life. <laughs> they have this power. And I've also noticed as I've gone and coded more, I didn't even include this um, in my TED Talk, that TED Talkers will also cue you for your emotion. So you'll notice that when a TED Talker or a really good business speaker, when they're getting into a story, they want you to feel like it's heart heartwarming. They'll use a specific heartwarming vocal tone. It sounds like this. When I saw her, I knew that I was going to change my life. And when I saw that, I decided she was the one for me. And the audience goes, mm -hmm. aww. aww. <laughs> like, they do the same thing with data. So they'll even use like a data tone of voice. They'll say, you know, this data is incredible. And what we found is that over 56% of people, and you're like, wow, 56% of people, <laughs> right? They even cue you. And that is warmth and competence. That's saying, I know my content so well, I can speak to you verbally, but also with my nonverbal and my vocal cues. I think that that's the definition of charisma. I think that when we talk about being congruent, being authentic, what we're talking about is actually someone who is so aligned that their words their gestures and their vocal are all on the same track. So if a TED speaker, and this is a this is a, a problem of the of the least popular TED speakers, the least popular TED speakers often rehearse the emotion out of their talk. So they come on mm -hmm. stage and this and they sound like this. And this is this is where our brain turns off. They go, uh, I'm so happy to be here. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about a big idea on how to change climate. 
And they, they say they're so happy to be here, but they don't sound happy to be here, right? If I were to say, I'm so happy uh, to be here. And that's because they've rehearsed that line so many times that the emotion has literally drained out of it. And so I think that the, so gestures, aligning them with our words is one piece. That's the beginner. And if anyone is a speaker, thinking about how you can highlight your words with your gestures is incredibly important. But second is, how do you make sure that you are aligning the right emotion with the, what you're trying to convey? Hmm. Yeah, the findings were so interesting. There's something about the first seven seconds too, yeah. right? Like you, you make the argument, which is very precise. You're not saying five, you're mm -hmm. not saying 10. Seven seconds. What's so magic about the first seven seconds, Vanessa? Our first impressions are incredibly important. And this is because, in a weird way, our brains are kind of lazy. What I mean by that is when we're meeting people or seeing speakers or clicking on YouTube videos or we have speaker after speaker or even different meetings, we're trying to very quickly decide, can I trust you and can I rely on you, right? We have to answer those two questions. If we had to consistently do that for an entire meeting, our brain would be so exhausted from trying to read those cues and it wouldn't be able to focus on the ideas. So what our brain has done, it's very efficient, is it says, okay, I'm gonna make my judgment about this person, if they're trustworthy and if they're smart, in the first seven seconds. Once I decide that, I'm gonna move on to trying to hear their ideas. And so those first seven seconds are almost like a lever. If you can get them right, the next hour, the next five hours are going to be way easier. If you get them wrong, it makes the next hour or five hours pretty miserable. And this is happening a lot, especially as we do more and more virtually. A lot of us are giving away our charisma in the first seven seconds by starting every video like this. Can you hear me? Can, can you see me? Hello? <laughs> hi, 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 hi. <laughs> done. <laughs> Your first done. You're out already. It was done. And so I think that that's the other reason why um, it's really hard. So it's not just on stage, but even the first seven seconds of someone seeing you is your first impression. And this is a mistake that a lot of business leaders make is they've prepared a perfect presentation and they think their impression starts the moment they start their, their start their presentation. But actually your first impression happens the moment someone first sees you. That might be you walking onto stage, taking a piece of paper and shaking hands with your introducer. That was it. That was your first impression. And so it's not just the first seven seconds of your talk or your presentation, which is very important. It's actually how you take the stage, how you start your video, how you walk into the conference room, the business room, the negotiation. Those are the first seven seconds I think are most forgotten. So I'm getting ready to give a presentation in front of leaders in Houston in a week. So tell me what to do in the next, the first seven seconds, because I'm replaying every talk I've ever done in my mind going, Yeesh. I hope I did okay. okay. Yeah. Yeesh. Yeah. So you did okay. You did great. So, okay. So you have a talk <laughs> coming up. I want you to think about, so do you know if someone's introducing you? Uh, that's a good question. Usually for me, I, you find out when you're at the event, it's either a bumper or someone's going to introduce you. But most of the time these days, it's a bumper. They introduce you, then they play the bumper, then you walk out on stage. Okay. So I now in my like, you know, little pre-speech form, um, I always ask, I ask, how am I going to be introduced and where will I be? Oh, great. This is a, it's a little life hack because it's not the worst thing in the world when you get there and you realize that you have to stand next to someone while they read your bio. Horrible. I mean, <laughs> that is horrible. terrible. So one, you want to be prepared for yeah. that if that's going to be you. And second, I also want you to be prepared for, are you coming off stage? Are you sitting on stage? Are you sitting in the audience? Are you going to have a bumper? I love a bumper, by the way, because it allows the video uh -huh. to speak for you. And then you, your first impression happens the moment the lights turn on, right? Like that's like a great, exactly. great one. So that's my favorite if I had to choose. But if you, and, then, and whenever the lights turn on, and this could be before your bumper, while someone's reading your intro, the very first thing you want to do is make sure your hands are visible. I know that's a very weird one. I know that sounds crazy, but our hands are a really integral part of our first impression. The reason for this is because our hands show intention. So our brains, when we can't see someone's hands, we are less likely to trust them. And that is because our hands show explanation. They show intention. They show if we're going to be greeted or not. My favorite thing to do, the moment I hop on video, the moment I walk on stage, if I am off stage, my bio is being read. The very first thing I do is I give a little wave to the audience, a little wave to the audience. 
morning when I hop on video, I, I don't even remember when I hopped on video with you. I was like, hello, morning. Yeah. How are you? Good to see you. Yeah, you did that. That's yeah. right. And that's so funny because that doesn't feel like it feels, I don't know, but, but when I see it, okay, what I'm trying to say is I think in my head that if I did that, it would be cheesy, but I'll give you a great example. Yeah. Of, of your theory in action. So there's a guy named Rick Warren. He pastors one of the largest churches in America. Been there four decades. He's in his 60s. Uh, it's a church of like 30,000 people. So my wife and I are there a few months ago. And I've never seen him live. I'm getting ready to interview him for this podcast. He hasn't been well. So he's not actually preaching that day. He shot it on video earlier. He walks out on stage. He smiles. He waves at this church he's known for four decades. And he goes, hey, everybody, just wanted to show up and see you in person today. And then he went into it. And I was won over. I was completely won over. That's it. So a wave is a subconscious cue. We don't even realize it. By the way, you might go back. If you were to go back and watch your favorite speeches or favorite sermons of all time, you might not even realize you got a little bit of a gesture at the very beginning. Even a wave, yes, but even just a good morning. With my hands both up. Yeah. Even that. Any kind of palm acknowledgement. I think the palm is the most underrated part of the body. Our palm is incredibly important for trust. Why? It shows I'm not hiding anything. I'm not concealing mm. anything. It's also a very, very subtle winner cue. What I mean by this is when we win, when we feel pride, we want to take up as much space as possible. And typically, if you look at winners who win races, they expand their arms and their hands. Usually their hands are big and they gesture towards the sky. This is a universal symbol of pride and winning. And we like to hear from, be around, and listen to winners. We just like it because mm. we want to catch it. And so in a weird way, a wave, or if a wave feels uncomfortable to you, even just opening with a broad palm gesture, good morning. Mm. Good so morning. To see you. Yeah. Right? Even that is very subtly saying, I feel proud and I want you to catch it. Mm -hmm. I feel confident in what I'm about to say, and you should feel confident too. I am open. I'm not concealing anything. And most importantly, you belong here. What really, really talented leaders do is they are constantly queuing for belonging. And we mm -hmm. need this now more than ever. So many people feel so disconnected and so alone. And if they're in an audience or in a room and you're not specifically cueing them to feel a sense of you're here with me and I want you here with me and you're accepted and you belong, when I do this with my hands, so I'm bringing you in, I'm showing my palm, it is literally a universal way of saying, come with me, come to mm -hmm. me. You belong here. I accept you. I am open to you. That is a gift. If we can do that in the first seven seconds, just show a palm. Wow. So easy. The other thing that surprised me, and I've heard you talk about this and you write about it, is one of the reasons to show your hands, don't walk out with your hands in your pocket, your hands behind your back, yes. is apparently this goes back to prehistoric times. We wonder, are you carrying a weapon? There you Which go. sounds crazy in the 21st century. But if you think about it, right, if I can't see your hands, what are you doing? Do you have a knife? Do you have a weapon? Do you have a club? Yeah. So what they found was, and this was a, a terrifying study, that when, so in court cases, in courtrooms, mm. if defendants put their hands under the table on their lap, and by the way, my mom taught me to put my hands in my lap, okay? When, when I was going right. to the table, it was no elbows on the table and hands in your lap, unless you were eating. That was the rule at the dinner table. So I, I, I joke with her now. I'm like, mom, like, that's not very charismatic. You should have told me to like move my palms <laughs> up. She's like, okay, honey, okay. So um, when defendants put their hands in their lap under the table, jurors rate them as more sneaky and untrustworthy. This is really, really bad news because our jurors are supposed to be listening to the verbal content, but we cannot help but look for subtle signals of openness, subtle signals of trust. And so just like you said, if we can't see someone's hands, we wonder what are they hiding and losers. So when we lose a race, when we're in shame or defeat or guilt, we close our hands. You'll see that, that losing athletes will often grip their hands into fists. They, they, they might even tuck their hands to their, their chest or hide them or cross them over their body. So we recognize shame as a closed, concealed hand. You know, one of the things I did in cues is I analyzed the cues hidden in the Last Supper. And, you know, the Last Supper is a painting I grew up looking at, right? Leonardo da Vinci is one of the most, most famous paintings in the world. Mm. 
And what I thought was so interesting is if you look at the hidden body language cues in that painting, Da Vinci depicted Judas as having a closed fist. He is the only apostle with a closed fist. Why? That was a subtle cue that Da Vinci was using to show concealment, shame, mm. guilt. Fist, a fist is also a sign of anger, right? So if we tightly grip our hands together, or tightly grip our fist, uh, we, we this, is, this is how we protect ourselves. Our knuckles, our hands have evolved into being a uh, fist because they're the most protective gesture. So here, even in the painting, we see Judas with a fist, whereas Christ is depicted with open hands. In fact, Christ is the only figure we can see with both palms showing. Mm. If you actually look at the Last Supper, and I, I did not catch this when I first looked at it the first hundred times, but when I started reading cues, and I break this down in the book, Christ is depicted with one palm up and one palm down, but you can see both of his mm. palms. Even in the Last Supper, Christ's first impression has a palm showing. And so I, I just think that this we don't even realize subconsciously how often we need to feel this sense of, of, of openness. And that happens, that starts with our cues. Well, it also answers the question, what do I do with my hands, there right? You Thank you, Will Ferrell. So <laughs> there you go. Uh, open palm. I love an open palm. So uh, let's talk about scripts yes. um, and reading from your notes. I've had strong opinions about this over the years, but agree? I'd love to know what the research says. Terry, do we, we did. Oh. This does not help, right? If you're reading from prepared notes, it does not help you. No. People, I so nuance the research a little bit, but I always would coach communicators because I train leaders through courses. And, and I'm like, I think the moment you start to read from a prepared script, people stop trusting you. There you go. I don't know. What do you think? Oh, this research is real. So actually, yeah. uh, there's a, a team uh, called Quantified Communications, and they use AI to analyze speeches in history and TED Talks, looking mm. for patterns between the most persuasive and successful speeches and the least successful um, speeches and uh, talks. And they just uh, they just submitted this research. So I always, I agree with you that scripts, the moment mm. you begin to read something, our brain has trouble listening to it, right? Like it's, it's, it's hard to actually grok someone who's reading something because we don't feel like it's coming from the heart. And also- Well, and your cadence, your tone of voice changes exactly, too. Exactly, it exactly. Does. So actually I want to read this research too because it literally just yeah. came out. So they analyzed, they wanted to know because they had the exact same problem is, do they mm. tell their, do, do they recommend, this is all based on software, do they recommend script or notes. So here's what they found, which I thought was just, this oh, just fascinating. This just came out. I just pre presented this yesterday in my webinar. Okay. Going off script, when does it help and when does it hurt? So prepared script versus spoken content for clarity and trust. So trust exactly. Mm. Spoken word is better by quite a lot. So script, you have less clarity and less trust. However, for persuasion and credibility, script does better than spoken. Now, here's what I know. So trust, you're absolutely right. If you want to build trust, if you want to have higher warmth, speaking from the heart without a script is better. But for persuasiveness and credibility, according to this software, according to the research, script is better. I think there's a way around this though, which is, of course, if you have a very um, a persuasive argument that you want to say perfectly, saying it perfectly is going to be a script, right? So I think mm. that what's critical here is not memorizing everything. So for your opener, your first seven seconds, your stories and your trust building parts of your presentations, not scripted. Mm. If you have a portion that you really want to get right, you really want to be very persuasive and have high credibility, that's a portion you might be able to read or at least have very detailed notes on. That's, I think, a more oh. nuanced way to think about it. And that actually helps me with some of my talks as well. Yeah, I can see it. I, I use um, screen slides if I'm doing it. It just is sort of a cue, yeah. uh, but it's got very minimal words. Like 99% of what I say is not there unless it's a quote. And then uh, the other thing too, it's like TED Talks. They do not allow you to read your TED Talks. You have to internalize it. Yeah. You have to quote, memorize it, right? So I can see that as being very effective. Uh, and so that's a question really of knowing your material, right? Yeah. Like you better be clear on it. You better know it. And here's a really uh, specific example. So if you're thinking about your presentation or a sermon or a talk, 
So making sure that your stories and your openers are not scripted. They come from the heart. Mm. Um, in my presentations, this is exactly what I do. My openers and my stories are all unscripted. But the part of my presentation I want to be most persuasive with is a specific quote from Dr. Susan Fisk, who did this uh, charisma research, that is, 82% of judgments of people are based on warmth and competence. That is the most persuasive thing in my presentation because it's the foundation. If you believe in warmth and competence, you're going to like everything else in my presentation. So that is one of my slides. And that is quote unquote scripted because I literally have her quote behind me. So if you could think about, okay, what's the one thing that your audience needs to believe or be persuaded by, that would be the one thing to have double down behind you as either a quote or a big mm. statement. That way it's maybe three sentences of scripting. That's it. But that's the one big idea. And that's the thing, the beauty of TED Talks is they make you think of one idea, right? Like when I pitched my TED Talk, they were like, what's your one big idea? And so that's the other thing we can think about is in our presentations and our talks, what is the one big idea? That might be the one thing that's scripted behind you, but everything else should go off script so that you have trust. Hmm. So this fuses your TED Talk research with also some of the other things in cues. And I want to drill down on that warmth, competence, where they intersect, you get charisma. And you cover that theme throughout the book. But you also talk about resting face. Oh, so yeah. I am super challenged with my resting face. Well, let me see uh, it. Let me see I, it. It looks good. Hold on, let me see. Well. Wait, let me see. Let me see. <laughs> You're good. There, I, my resting face for real? Yeah. No, my re resting face for real. Okay, let me stop smiling. Here we okay, go. Okay, let me see. Oh, I can tell you why. I can tell you exactly oh, what? why. Yeah. What's going on? Okay, so I call this resting bothered face. So resting bothered yes. face, right, is basically- That's a very polite way of saying it. Very polite way of saying it. I like to be polite. Is that at rest, you look a little bit bothered, tired, sad, I angry, do. upset. Angry. Yeah. Here is why. So you and I actually have the exact same problem. People who struggle with resting bothered face, and this is actually an important thing to know about yourself, especially if you're mm. doing a lot of interfacing with people- is the shape of your facial features can look like facial expressions. So there are oh. universal facial expressions, and some of the negative ones are sadness, anger, and fear, which I talk about in the book. So if you're resting face, so let's talk about sadness, because that's what we both have. So sadness is when we pull the corners of our mouth down into a frown, mm. and we pout out our lower lip, and we pinch the inner corners of our eyebrows together, and we droop our lids. Mm. That's sadness. <laughs> you and I both have the same problem, that at rest, both of our mouths turn down. So here's me at rest. They do. But I'm at rest. I'm yep. not pulling my mission down. You have the exact same problem. So because of that, our face, our, our mouth is shaped down. So it tends to look like a frown. So you will think, oh, are you okay? Are you sad? Yes. Are you upset? I get that all the time. Why are you upset? My kids, dad, are you mad at me? I'm like, I'm not mad at you. My um, wife's like, what's wrong? I'm like, nothing's wrong. If you keep asking me something, it'll be wrong, but nothing's wrong. And then- <laughs> You know, I'm I'm like, fortunately, for two years of solid Zoom, I've been on video many times before, but you kind of look at yourself. And now, even when I'm doing these interviews, Vanessa, I'm like, smile, smile, you're on for the next hour, smile, smile. So to go to my resting phase was a Hard. little bit of work, but yeah. yeah. Okay, so two things for folks. Well, actually, three things. One is figure out what your face at rest looks like. Does it look like anger? Like, for example, a really common one is anger, actually, where if you have two vertical lines between your eyebrows, even when you're at rest, people are going to think you're angry. And that's because those two vertical lines, that furrow is part of the universal anger microexpression. So hmm. look at your face and figure out what is what is the default, right? Like, what are you most similar to? That's probably what people think you are. Second, PSA. Talk to the important people in your life, your partner, your kids, your colleagues, the people you're working with and say, hey, I listened to this great podcast with Carrie and Vanessa, and they told me I have resting bothered face. When you see these two vertical lines, I am not angry. That's just my face, mm. right? So that is a mm. very fun little PSA to give the people in your life. So you no longer have to fake it with them, right? You want them to know that's just the way your face looks. And that's exactly what my husband knows. He knows I'm not angry at just the way my <laughs> face is. This, the third thing, this is a harder one, is exactly what you said, is when you're on back-to-back -back Zoom interviews, you want to encourage the person who's speaking. I think that there is a small difference between smiling all the time, which is exhausting, and doing what I call up face. So what I will do is just very slightly, instead of when I'm at rest, my mouth turns down, I just very slightly engage the corners of my mouth so that they're slightly up. So this isn't hmm. actually a smile. So how do I look like this? Let me see. How's that look? There you go. Just up, it's just engaged. You can't just slightly, smile. so I'm not smiling, no. but 
It's up a little bit. It's, it shows I'm listening, I'm engaged. So if you can think about um, your resting face, is there a way that when you are listening to someone, you want to show interest engagement that you can deactivate that cue? That way you can turn it on or off depending on what you're doing. Good to know. And I wish I could get two decades of meetings back Fine. before I really understood default rest face. I'm like, how many closed doors <laughs> meetings was I in where everybody thought I was mad? I um, so... <laughs> Honestly, I highly recommend cues. I'm going to keep it on my shelf uh, as a reference book. I think it kind of works as a reference book oh, for that, self-awareness. That's the greatest comment you can give me. I kind Is it? Of, okay. Yes, because there are 96 cues in the book. And the book actually started as a glossary. As like, what is this cue? What what is this mouth shrug? What is this lip purse? What is an eyebrow raise? What is like what is a steeple? I had all the different cues. And then I realized it actually was too overwhelming. You, you couldn't memorize all 96, but you could if you thought of them as warmth, competence, and charisma. So in the book, I split them up into warmth, competence. But my goal is for you to use it just like a glossary or a handbook that when you're like, I need to show up as warm in this meeting, you literally pull out the book, you open the warm chapter, you're like, right, here are the six warmth cues, <laughs> right? Or I need to show up as competent. Here are my six competent cues. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the um, the frequent flyer problems, all right? Because leaders, I mean, we have enough problems. That's what you do, right? When you're a leader, yeah. you solve all the problems nobody right. else could figure out. So there you are. So your job's already hard, but sometimes we make it harder because we're sending off signals we don't even realize that are compounding the situation. And we kind of, we touched on it already. We talked about it in the context of public speaking, but let's talk about everyday life. Yes. What are some of the top miscues, if you can call them that, yes. that people will emit? Just give us a, a random sampling of a few uh, that you're like, yeah, don't do this. Okay, so the first one might surprise you. The biggest mistake that leaders make in day-to-day -day interactions, this is off stage, is they under cue, they under signal. Mm. And this is because of a very pervasive miss. And I actually think it's gotten worth, worse over the last few years that to be powerful, you should be stoic. You should mute your <sighs> cues. You should hide your cues. You should not show your cards. You should be a blank slate. The problem is, is this is the opposite of charismatic. When we have people who mm. mute or who go stoic or who go unreadable, it causes anxiety and confusion for the other people you're with. Why? As humans, we need to have a cue back and forth, right? So as humans, we are constantly looking to others, especially our leaders, for how we should think, act, behave, and feel. So if we're with a leader who is absolutely unreadable, they have, they have removed all their cues, we get a little anxious. We're like, are they mad at me? Do they like me? What should I do? Mm -hmm. Do they trust me? Mm -hmm. And also can't catch anything, right? So if leaders go in under signaling, you become less contagious. So what leaders will do is they'll walk into a room or hop on a video call with their team and they're under queuing and the team kind of gets a little antsy, like a little fidgety, and you leave the room either the same as it was or worse than it was. I have a belief that true leaders leave every room better, right? They leave the room better than where they found like it. That. How do you do it? You show up with warm and competent cues. You literally are gifting warmth and confidence to your team. So for that little bit of face-to-face -face time with the people you're interacting with, make that time a way to make yourself positively contagious so you're leaving them better. So the biggest mistake is actually withholding your cues, that I muting is in itself a cue. Okay, that is really helpful to know, but that raises a question for me. How do I know if that's me, whether I'm under cueing? So would mm -hmm. you, like, what kinds of things would your team be saying? Would yeah. it be something like, um, Carrie, I can't tell what you're thinking or right. what is your response um, or what are yeah. some of the things that would cue you that you're that person? That's a great one. So, uh, Carrie, I can't tell what you're thinking. Or you're so hard to read. Or you're so ah. mysterious. Or I never know what I should say. Or questions like, are you angry? Are you upset? Mm. Are you okay with this? I never know if you like something or not. <laughs> those phrases where you know the other way that you can do it if you're if you don't remember if you get those comments sometimes um leaders they they just don't uh value that feedback because they don't realize it's actually feedback they think it's just a comment is watch yourself on a recorded zoom call so go try to find yourself on a zoom call and i want you to count the number of cues you emit during the meeting so highly charismatic people are constantly queuing very small 
So how often do you nod? How often do you head tilt? How often do you smile? Any of the 90s excuse. How often are you using a varied vocal power? How, like, I want you to actually count the number of cues. If you're having trouble counting any movement at all, it's probably you are under cueing. <laughs> probably. If you are right. very still and very stoic with very little movement and a very, very simple clipped kind of tone of voice. And that's another thing that can happen with leaders is they are so over talked, right? They like, they just talked for a half an hour on uh, in the front of the room. They don't want to make chit chat. They don't want to do small talk. They're solving tons of problems. And so they will, so when they do speak about other things, they'll speak short and clipped, right? Just get, get it done. Get it out as quickly as possible. That's also a sign of under cueing. And the danger with that, I suppose, if I'm reading your research right, is you are neither warm nor competent yeah, when you, you do that. You're not, you're not emitting competence, which creates confidence, or warmth, which is approachability. You're just kind of uh, flatlined at that. Okay, do you have another like yes. big mistake that you see people make all the time? Yes. Okay, so this is also one of my scripted slides behind me. So uh, when I was reading Dr. Susan Fisk's research and this about this warmth and confidence, this is a, a landmark study. There's been many studies built upon this work. So it's not like it's one small one. It's a huge game-changing study on warmth and competence. So the first one was 82% of our judgments of people are warmth and competence, the majority. The second one, this is my next scripted slide, which shocked me when I read it, shocked me, is competence cues without warmth cues leave people feeling suspicious. This is the next mistake that my brilliant, smart leaders make. Leaders are often off the charts smart, right? Like that's how they got to where they are. They are so smart, in fact, they rely on their smarts. They rely on how smart they are and they forget about the warmth part. And that is how you can get leaders who are really high in competence, but no one trusts them. People don't feel like they can believe them. People don't feel like they want to have coffee with them. The key is you want to be the kind of leader that people want to take you out to coffee and they also want to listen to a life-changing speech that you give, right? Mm. You want to actually have people do both. If you are too high in competence without enough warmth, People will say things like, oh, I could never go and talk to her. I, I could never right. talk to her. No, 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 no. She, you know, he's up there. You know, like I could never do that. That means you're over hitting competence cues, which means you must add warmth cues, especially with your colleagues, especially on stage. So a couple warmth cues that are my favorite, very easy ways to just slowly tip the scales or dial up in warmth. One is a slow triple nod. So research finds that a slow triple nod, so nod, 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 gets the other person to speak three to four times longer. So if you're on a Zoom call or you're in a meeting, just going, uh-huh, 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 they're like, oh, he or she is really listening. I better dig deeper. That is a very simple, silent warmth cue of, I'm with you. I'm open. Mm. I gotcha. So a slow triple nod is something to keep in your back pocket. Now note that is not a bobblehead. Okay, so we can right, go, right. Right, we can go too high in warmth when you have someone who's just nodding all the time. Uh-huh, 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 uh-huh. It's also not a fast nod. So the difference between a slow nod and a fast nod is a slow nod shows engagement. A fast nod shows impatience. So a slow nod. Right. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Versus uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, all the difference in the world. All the difference yeah. in the world. So a fast nod actually makes you more cold. That's finish up. I got it. Finish up. Hurry up. Hurry up. So a slow triple nod. Keep that in your back pocket. You also can try a head mm. tilt. So a head tilt, right, when we expose our, our ear up to the side is a, a universal sign of I'm listening because when we expose our ear, we're literally trying to hear something better. If you ask someone, can you hear that? People will mm. tilt their heads. So it's a universal listening cue. Yeah. And you can do this quite mm. subtly. So if, if you are told that you're cold and stoic, the easiest way to warm yourself up is a very slight head tilt. It literally is saying, I got it. I'm listening. I'm open. I'm exposing my ear to you. That is literally what you're showing. So very, very small, but they really help. So what happens if you're warm, you're giving off too many warmth cues? I think, you know, business leaders have the stereotype of too competent, not enough warmth, but pastors, a lot of them... They're super warm, nice people, but they're not exuding yes. competence and people don't end up following them. Absolutely. So this is the other side, right? So and by the way, some of these cues sound small, but I kind of, if you play golf, I think the, a metaphor here is, you know, 
tiny tweaks to your golf swing can have all the difference in your game. It can massively mm. change your impact. Cues are the exact same way. These small little tweaks can have a massive impact on your charisma. So it might sound small to add a head tilt or a nod. That is the difference between someone feeling like they were heard in a meeting and not heard. Like literally mm. those. Yeah. Things. So you're not talking about a personality. No. Right? No. I'm talking about little dials. These little tweaks have these massive impacts in your interaction. So we talked about competent to warmth. How about warm to competent? So first is making sure you're not bobbleheading, right? So you want to <laughs> dial down your nods, make sure you're not in a perma head tilt, right? That makes you look like a dog, right? You know how dogs constantly turn their <laughs> dog, right? right? So no perma head tilt, no perma nodding. So not too much of those warmth cues. And then for competence, I think that the biggest one is the amount of space you take up. And I don't mean like you should walk into every room with your arms wide and you're, <laughs> and you're, and you're you know, with apart. That would be absolutely ridiculous. Uh, that is the biggest misinterpretation I think people get around like power posing, quote unquote. Uh, which power pose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Super so woman, super man. All the rage, yeah. all the rage in, in 2010. I, I, the, I, I love that idea, but it actually isn't super practical to like walk on stage or walk into a meeting, you know, in a power pose. What I do want you to think about is a very, are micro movements. And these are going to sound so small, but just try them with me. Okay, first, the distance between your earlobe and your shoulder. So try to shrink that distance. So if you pull, pull your shoulders up and you shrink your head down, you will literally begin to feel like you are anxious. You can't speak as well. I notice that sometimes highly warm folks out of competence, they will, they shrink down. So they bow their head. They put their shoulders up. They can also accidentally do this when they're reading something. So if you hold a book on stage or you have a podium, I will notice people will creep up where they have very little distance between their earlobes and their shoulder. That is the number mm. one way we decide if someone is a winner or not. If someone is taking up space, oh. their shoulders are rolled down, their head is up, there's tons of space between their earlobe and their shoulder, we think, winner their shoulders are relaxed, mm. their head is up. They're not protected. You're right. I'm seeing different people and that's exactly the impression I have. Yes. And so my low yeah. competent speakers, and I work with a lot of, of students who are like, I don't why, know why people are checking their phones while I'm talking. I don't mm. know why I'm not getting good feedback from presentations. And I will watch their presentation on silent and I'll measure. I'll say, how much space do you think is between your ear and your shoulder? Very little, right? They're they're hunched over a book. They have their arms yeah. tightly to their side. Shoulders up like this. Right, right. Hand they're, gestures are kind of... And they're like a penguin. Yeah. Right? Like a penguin. Yeah, like a right? penguin. Penguin right. walk. And I say, you are yeah. signaling low competence. We don't want to catch that low competence. So people literally will distract themselves thinking about their to-do list, checking their email, checking social media, because they don't want to catch it. We don't like to listen to people who are like this because it looks like a loser. Now, that's a terrible way right. of saying it, but that is what we're cueing. Wow. Well, Vanessa, I'll tell you, the book is fantastic. It really is. And you make it easy. It's got pictures, by the way. And uh, <laughs> for leaders. Uh, and I, did, I did Audible too. So if you oh. like audiobooks, I I do lots of demos and I uh, there's a whole section on vocal power and I do all the vocal demos for you. So if you're if you're not if not a reader, you're a listener. I got you covered. There's a whole section on vocal cues, verbal cues, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, you get into how to write an email to be warmer or more competent yeah. too with scripts, which is so good. Uh, anyway, I just want to thank you for being with us. So I know you're going to be at the Global Leadership Summit again this year, along with Craig Rochelle and many others. Uh, but where can people find you if they are, are interested in learning more? Yes. Well, by the way, I'm so excited for Global Leadership Summit because I'm doing a brand new talk. Mm. So everything we talked about today, none of it's covered in my new talk coming up. I'm a little nervous. <laughs> a little nervous about it. But I'm super excited. It's going to be a brand new talk um, on connection and leaders, how leaders can connect. Otherwise, please come visit me on my YouTube channel. I do all kinds of cues breakdowns for TED Talks and uh, even The Rock. <laughs> so I have some fun with some cues breakdowns. And our website is sciencepeople.com if you want to check out some of our deeper learning resources, our newsletter, as well as my courses. Well, Vanessa, I hope we get to do this again. Thank you so much for being with us. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for watching the Carrie Newhoff Leadership Podcast on YouTube. I hope it's helped you thrive in life and leadership. And if you haven't yet checked out the Art of Leadership Academy, inside you'll find everything you need to lead, grow, and run a church. And now a word from our sponsor, Belay. 
If you've ever struggled with bookkeeping, watch this video because not only is it gonna increase your peace of mind, but you're gonna wonder why you waited so long. It's tax season. I still need all of your vendors' W-9 forms from last year. Here. <laughs> That's nice, sweetheart, but I'm not thirsty. Whoa, whoa. A belay bookkeeper? Really? Is that where we are now? I took care of the forms for Dan this morning. They are already in your inbox. Oh. Mm -hmm. So, okay. let's Good. let them enjoy their day. Never miss a moment. Leave the tea. Modern staffing right from Belay. Great, please. You know there's not even any real tea in there? Oh, well, she's a young girl. Let her have fun. Have fun today, sweetie. Get out. Go. You are being ridiculous. <laughs> 